Well, folks, I know there's a lot of people out there scared about the PayPal earnings that are coming here and Palantir earnings that are coming here in the next 48 hours. PayPal reports Wednesday after the bell. Palantir reports Thursday before the bell. So both earnings are coming in the next 48 hours from uh, basically the time I record this video. And a lot of people are very scared. I am zero percent scared in regards to both these earnings. And in today's video, I'm going to explain why I am 0% scared in regards to both these earnings, kind of what my plans are here, what I'm thinking is going to happen here in all those sorts of things. So I thought this was an important video to go through, given that both these are huge earnings coming here in a very short amount of time. Now, first off, let's be very clear, folks. And by the way, thank you everybody that subscribed to the channel. I appreciate y'all being here as always. And uh, it's going to be a fun next 48 hours. When, when we look at Palantir and PayPal, these stocks have been completely different as far as the way they've reacted this year, right? Palantir is up 131% this year. PayPal, on the other hand, is down 30% this year. So the, the stock prices have diverged massively. But here we are at this moment where I own both these stocks. I'm very excited about the futures of both these stocks. And uh, I've added a lot of PayPal shares over the last few months. And either I'm wrong or I'm right in regards to the stock. And I think I'm right, right? And uh, by the way, I'm going to be covering both these earnings. And I'll be covering all these earnings live on Twitch. So if you haven't followed me on there, make sure you follow me. Tomorrow's going to be a record-breaking live stream on Twitch. Uh, it's going to be a record-breaker for us. It's going to be absolutely incredible because we got PayPal reporting, also Elf and a Shelf reporting, Airbnb, Etsy, Qualcomm. But let's be honest, PayPal. It's going to be a record-breaking live stream. We're going to react to those earnings live on there, and we're going to listen to a conference call live on there. It's going to be an all-time record-breaker. So make sure you follow me on there if you care at all about PayPal stock. That will be pinned comment down there. Okay. All right, guys. So let's start going through this. Where I actually want to start today's video is showing you the setup for PayPal going into these earnings. I always think about how's the setup going into these earnings. Is it, is it bullish? Is it bearish? <clears throat> you know, kind of lets me know the vibes of the market a little bit, right? And so in regards to the setup for PayPal, extremely bearish. The one month chart is down over 12.5% just in the past month, right? So clearly there's no excitement whatsoever going into these earnings for PayPal. No excitement. If there was any any blip of excitement going on these, into these PayPal earnings, the stock would be up at least a decent amount going into these earnings. The fact that we're down 12.5% the past month shows there's no excitement. But this next chart, I think, is much more telling on what's actually going on. Check this out. This is a one-month chart for a lot of the other fintech-related companies. So I threw in Square in, in regards to this, which Square owns Cash App right? Which is a competitor to Venmo. I threw an upstart. I threw in a firm. So other fintech companies, right? And if we see all these stocks have been hit here recently, squares down nine and a half percent or so in the past one month. Obviously we spoke about PayPal, 12 and a half percent. Upstart's down almost 16% in the past one month. And if we look at a firm, a firm's down over 16% in the past one month. All of these fintech companies have been devastated here for a while and just continue to get obliterated here in the short term, right? This is two years of brutalness. I backed this up from about two years ago or so. This is all these fintech companies peaked around October of 2021. And since that time, folks, it, it has been, I mean, just brutal is the way I can describe it, right? PayPal is down 78%. Square is down 82%. Affirm's down 87%. Upstart's down 92%. It's been just two years of brutal action, for all of these stocks that are in the fintech space, they all just have gone absolutely obliterated, nasty style. Now, this, if we go back to the tech bubble, right, which if we go back to the 2021 market, that was the closest thing we've ever seen to a modern day tech bubble, right? Because the tech bubble was a, a moment in time when companies' valuations got way too stretched. They went to insane levels. Um, everybody was only looking at the bullish thesis in regards to stocks in general, and we had a blow off the top situation. Now, the situation we had in 2021 wasn't as dramatic. One, valuations didn't get to as high at levels. Two, at least you had real business models with substantial revenues in the 2021 market versus a 2000 market where it was just like, how many eyeballs can we get on this website? At least these companies, even if you look at all the fintech companies, all those companies have actual users, actual revenues coming in through the door, um, and, and all those sorts of things, okay? So, not as dramatic, but still, if we go back to the tech bubble and we see how long did the tech bubble, how, did, how long did the NASDAQ fall for, we find that it was about a two and a half year drop. Okay, two and a half year drop. The NASDAQ peaked in March of 2000, and then it finally bottomed out in September of 2002. So it was a two and a half year drop. Now, when I show you these fintech stocks, folks, uh, these stocks have been brutalized for just over two years, right? 
which is very in line with when we bought them for the tech bubble. So I would say all of these fintech stocks, not just PayPal, but I think all of these fintech stocks likely bought them in the next six months. That's what I would say overall. And it's a very high probability a lot of them are going to bottom in this current quarter we're in right now. So do keep that in mind. Now, here's where we need to split PayPal from the rest of the fintechs. And this is extremely, extremely important. Okay, PayPal has been brought down with all these companies. But there's a massive difference between PayPal and all these other fintech companies. Let me show you what the difference is. Robinhood, negative EPS. Rocket, negative EPS. Affirm, negative EPS. Square, negative EPS. Upstart, negative EPS. Coinbase, negative EPS. SoFi, negative EPS. PayPal, money printer. Money printer. They are Jerome Powell's money printer. Okay, let's call it that. So this is where the stock market gets a little silly and a little ridiculous. They throw all these stocks together. These stocks are not equal. PayPal is not equal to a firm. It's silly. But when you're in a group with all these stocks, you get grouped in together and you get obliterated with the rest of them. Despite this one having a massive difference of being a money printer versus everybody a money loser. That's silly. And the way, the way I would describe this and how silly this is to, to group PayPal in with the rest of the fintechs, which is the only reason really fin, uh, PayPal's fallen. If you want to know why PayPal's fallen so dramatically, it has nothing to do with margins and cash flows and all the other BS that people are going to try to put it on. The reason that stock has fallen like 80% is because it's grouped in with all the other fintech stocks that are all also down 80 to 90%. It has nothing to do with the numbers. It has nothing to do with the old CEO. None of that. It's all baloney. It's all baloney. They'll make you believe it was this or that or this or that. It had nothing to do with any of that, folks. It's all a bunch of baloney. It's the bottom line is it's a fintech company grouped in with other fintech companies and all the other fintech companies are down 80, 90 plus percent. And so throw PayPal down as well. It's stupid. It's not smart, folks. It's, it's equivalent of saying, hey, you know what? Meta and Snapchat, they're the same company because they both have social media platforms and they both have advertisers. So they're the same. No, of course they're not the same. One company is massively more successful than the other. One company has a way different executive team, a way different balance sheet, a way different income statement, way different users, way different amount of time spent on their platform. They're not the same company. Saying PayPal is the same as all these other companies is like saying Amazon is the same as eBay. No, of course Amazon is not the same as eBay. Well, they both sell things online, so they're all the same. No, that's silly. It's like saying NVIDIA is the same as Intel. Well, they both sell chips, so they're both the same. No, of course not. NVIDIA is its own game, it's its own income statement, it's own balance sheet, it's its own products, and Intel is as well. And so to throw PayPal in with these other stocks is nothing short of ludicrous. It's nothing short of a, 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 nothing short of a horrible decision by Wall Street. You can call it the machines, you can call it Wall Street, whatever it is, but they made a horrible decision here, and it creates insane arbitrage for an investor like myself. And uh, I think we're going to see that play out over time. Now, to go to the numbers and why I'm not scared at all, Okay, here's the deal. This is last quarter. Now, last quarter was a weaker quarter. And since then, we've gotten a lot of great news, which means this upcoming quarter is going to be likely very, very, very good. The weaker quarter, we still had, this is on a gap basis, generally accepting accounting principles, re net revenues up 7%, operating income up 48%, EPS up 414% on a gap basis. Non-gap. So if you want to, you know, take out one-time things and all that stuff, okay. 8% revenues were up, right? 20% operating income was up. Earning per share up 24%. It doesn't matter which way you slice it. Gap or non-gap, the quarter was phenomenal last quarter. And the best thing for PayPal is things have strengthened. How do I know things have strengthened? I'll show you how I know. Visa. Look at Visa and look at those earnings are reported. Visa fiscal Q4 earnings beat consensus on strong spending cross border, border volume. Visa numbers looked very very healthy, wealthy, and stealthy. Very good overall. And if Visa numbers are good, PayPal numbers are going to be good as well. It goes further than that. Meta, right? If Meta's numbers are strong, PayPal's numbers are going to be very strong as well. If pay Meta's numbers are weak, it's likely going to mean PayPal's weak, okay? Meta crushed, crushed ex expectations, and they beat on revenue by $700 million, right? So Meta's business is far better than analysts expected as well. We'll take it a step further. Amazon, massive e-commerce company, right? Amazon destroyed their earnings and they beat on revenue by over $1.5 billion, folks, okay? So Visa earnings, great. 
Meta earnings great. Amazon earnings great. I can tell you, likely PayPal, if anything, they're going to see strengthening in their business, strengthening their revenue profile, strengthening their operating income, and strengthening their net income in earnings per share as well. Okay. Now, here's another phenomenal thing and another reason I'm not scared at all going into these earnings. Okay. Even after this troubling time PayPal's had, which really is only troubling with their stock price, it's not troubling in their numbers, but this troubling time PayPal's gone through, okay? You know how many times they've missed in the past six quarters? They missed one time and only on the revenue item, okay? So you can miss on earnings per share, you can miss on uh, you know revenue, and so there's a 12 potentials there that you could miss on, and they've missed one out of those 12 in the past six quarters in this troubling time. And they missed by about $8.5 million revenues back in the fourth quarter of 2022, okay? So I'm looking at a PayPal that likely set up Alex Chris, a new CEO, in a very strong position. Also, Alex Chris, this is his first conference call. I'm very confident in his abilities, um, given the, the kind of pedigree he has in his background and whatnot as well, okay? So I'm not scared at all, right? Now, here's the next component I'm not scared at all, Okay. This stock, uh, it doesn't matter what happens with it. I'm set up perfectly. So let's say the stock goes up, okay? Cool. All my shares become worth more money. My account says a bigger balance. Great. Now let's say the stock goes down. It's even better. I'm not done buying PayPal shares. I have, I, I want to at least buy PayPal for the next two months, but I'm looking to likely buy PayPal until at some point in the first quarter of 2024, I'll stop buying the stock and I'll have my position fully built out. So the, the bottom line is I have anywhere from two to five months left of buying the stock. Would I rather be able to buy the stock at $45, $55, $65, $75? Of course, I'd rather buy it at 45, right? So the best case scenario for me would be PayPal actually goes down, which creates another situation for me where I'm not scared at all because literally go down, like, go down, send the stock down. Beautiful for me. Let's say the stock stays flat. Awesome. I'd love to pick up more PayPal shares at $51. It's a steel deal. PayPal's going to 200 plus long-term in my personal opinion. So regardless of what happens with the stock price tomorrow, I'm set up perfectly. Now I have done something else in regards to PayPal stock very recently other than just buy the stock. Okay. I now own a lot of shares of PayPal, but I've also started buying a little leaps recently. In regards to basically long-term call options that expire a little a little longer than two years from now. I'm not a big leap player. I'm not a big options player in general. But if I see such an opportunity, I've got to do a little bit there. Okay. And so I have bought a little leaps that are going to expire December 2025. So I have about two to plus years until these leaps expire. And um, here's the deal. Okay. Meta taught me a little bit of a lesson. I, you know, 2021, I t- was taking way too much risk. 2022 not taking enough risk. 2023, I'm kind of finding a a perfect balance in between those two, right? And so what Meta taught me was I was buying that stock as it dropped, 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 right? Now I'm up $325,000 on my shares in the public account, right? And I was buying that stock, buying that stock, buying that stock, buying that stock as it fell, 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 right? And the more it fell, the more I was like, this is so just dumb. Like this is ridiculous. Like the valuations on the stock have gotten to just silly pricing, silly pricing, right? And how I should have finished out my capping of buying of Meta, especially in around October, November, when that stock went under 120 and then under 100, is I should have started buying some long-term call options, some options that expired in 2025 or late 2024, something like that. I could have done that and I should have done that. I was just so risk adverse because it's 2022 was such a brutal year to me that I didn't, I didn't do it, right? I should have done it because even $10,000 worth of long-term call options would now be worth probably six figures plus. Now at this point in time, even $10,000 would it be worth six figures plus today. I would have probably taken a lot of those profits back in the summertime when Meta first hit uh, $300 a share. That would have been my moment where I just probably cashed a ton of those and just took you know six figures of gains on a very minimal amount going in, right? So I could have been sitting on a lot bigger gains than what I'm sitting on, but I was just a little risk adverse. So in regards to PayPal, I see the stock going to laughable numbers. And I'm just in a situation where I'm like, I've got to go ahead and, and take advantage of this. And I've got to buy a little leaps in regards to this smaller position sizing. And you know, if the stock goes any lower, which I'm not even very confident the stock's going to go much lower than where it's at now. But even if it does, that will be nibbling off a little more leaps there to kind of cap off my position here in this last few months 
of uh, PayPal stock overall. So I'm 0% scared about PayPal. I'm nothing but excited. Doesn't matter what way the stock moves. It's a perfect situation for me. And uh, even if the stock goes up, let's say it goes up and it's $59 after earnings, $59, 59.50, let's say. It's still a steel deal in my opinion. It's like when Meta went from 88 up to 98, right? Still a steel deal, like it doesn't matter to me, right? Um, PayPal could go to $75. I would still be buying PayPal stock. It's probably not going to $75 tomorrow, but it literally, if, if PayPal's $75 after hours, I'm still buying PayPal to the end of year. It doesn't matter. If PayPal's $95 after hours, not happening, let's say it was 95, I'm still buying PayPal shares. It literally doesn't matter. It's such a steel deal at this point. It's silly. It's gotten grouped in with a stall out of stocks that it shouldn't be grouped in with and is what it is. And it's an ultra primetime player playing on a very bad team. And the team is FinTech and it's a lot of bad players on that team. And we got one superstar and his name is PayPal. And uh, zero percent worried about PayPal, okay? It's a perfect situation. All right, next up here, Palin. Tier. I am 0% worried about Palantir stock on these earnings. Why am I 0% worried about Palantir? Well, first off, I'm holding uh, 5,555 shares in the public account going into these earnings. And Palantir is also my fourth biggest position in the Patreon portfolio. So it's a rather important stock for me overall. It might be my fifth or sixth biggest position in the public account, but my fourth biggest in the Patreon portfolio. So it's a very important stock to me, right? By the way, if you want to see all the moves I'm making each and every week, the buys and sells um, in my Patreon portfolio, go ahead and check out the description area. There's a link down there. You can join me in there and uh, join the Discord chat and all that fun stuff, okay? But very important stock overall. Now, in regards to Palantir, you... Let's be honest, okay? The interest income is going to keep pouring in. All the money that, that Palantir has in treasuries that they're making a fortune on right now, the money's going to keep coming in for the next several quarters, right? Because they, they have that money in treasuries and they're going to continue to earn that money for at least a short term here, right? On those treasuries. And if anything, treasury rates have gone up a little bit over the past, you know, several months. So that money's going to keep pouring in. The Fed's not cutting until who knows when. Um, the pro the Fed's going to start thinking about cutting probably in the middle of 2024 toward late 2024. But the bottom line is for the next several quarters, interest income is going to continue to pour into Palantir, right? Which is going to help their profitability in an immense way. Never mind the revenue increases year over year on top of that, right? And getting some operating leverage in the business model. Like when you take all those into account, we could be looking at some you know, pretty impressive EPSs over the next many quarters. Now, also low expectations for the company's revenue, right? 16% for this quarter, we're in 18% for next quarter, 17% for the first quarter of 2024. The expectations are not super high for earnings per share for Palantir or, or revenue. And that that is very appealing to me, extremely appealing to me, okay? I love a stock that does not have big expectations. Now, by the way, those are still impressive revenue growth numbers. Just for Palantir, it's not the most uh, impressive, right? No, we have multiple world conflicts going on simultaneously right now, right? And there's also more potentials of other conflicts. So in regards to Palantir, there's a couple ways to look at this, okay? The first way is Palantir's need in the world is not becoming less. It's becoming more, right? If you're going to talk about more conflicts, uh, more things that are needed on the battlefield, it's all Palantir. It comes back to Palantir. You have to have Palantir on the battlefield. Bottom line, okay? And so Palantir is going to likely continue to see, you know, bigger and bigger numbers of revenue come in from the government side of the United States on the military side and potentially from, you know, let's call it friendly governments to the United States as well, right? The second component of this I think is very important is credibility when it comes to Alex Karp, okay? Alex Karp's credibility has gone up immensely this past, I would say, year and a half. Why? I'll explain to you why. Who is a man that was going on all these interviews, going everywhere, you know, for the last two, three years, and telling everybody it's a dangerous world, it's about to get a lot more dangerous? And a lot of people are like, I don't know about that. It was Alex Karp, okay? People don't forget that. And so now Alex Karp's looking and he's, he sees the conflict, obviously, Russia, Ukraine, he sees what's going on in the Middle East. He sees potential escalations happening there, right? We got China, Taiwan hanging out there, and he's like, hmm, didn't I call this? Didn't I tell you guys the world was about to get a lot more dangerous? 
didn't I tell you a lot of people were going to be fighting pretty soon here? And so now everybody kind of looks at Alex Carpenter like, maybe this guy, this crazy guy with the crazy hair, maybe he knows a little something. Maybe, maybe, just maybe he knows a little something. Maybe he's got a little bit of a different view of the world than maybe we have, and maybe we should adapt his view a little bit because maybe he knows a little something that's going on, right? I mean, after all, a guy and his companies are in with the U.S. government. So, shoot, shouldn't he probably know a little bit what's going on? Think about that for a moment. Guy's company is in bed with the U.S. government, military, and a lot of other important countries in the United States. I'm going to guess he probably has a little bit of an understanding of what's going on in the world and what's likely to transpire, right? You know, that's just a little food for thought there, right? So, in regards to this... It's, it's obviously all these conflicts. It's something that will continue to benefit Palantir's business model for years to go in the future. Apollo and Gotham specifically, right? In terms of their products. And then on top of that, CARP having more credibility than ever. Now, CARP also was on BBC here very recently speaking about NHS um, likely deal that's coming. And that should be huge for Palantir for 2024, 2025, and obviously future years. And uh, I thought he represented himself pretty good overall there. I really did. I was, I thought he didn't do, you know, couldn't have done better, right? So you got that going on. You have all these different contracts and different announcements that have happened, right? They got the big contract with the Army recently, the PwC collaboration, which is one of the big four accounting firms. You got this deal, CAS, or CA, CAZ Investments selects Palantir as its artificial intelligence platform, AIP. Palantir Technology signs partnership with Titan Defense Firm. So you just see like Palantir starting to roll in these deals one after another after another. And remember, when Palantir is rolling in deals, folks, these aren't little mini nothing deals. These are huge deals with huge implications of money. I mean, the NHS deal alone, we're talking about that's a, that's a half a... That's, a, that's well over half a billion dollar deal just in itself. Like these are huge deals, okay? Also hearing more and more hype and excitement around Palantir's AI, which is going to continue to bring more and more attention on the commercial side to what Palantir's got going on on the AI side, right? Palantir ranked number one vendor in AI, data science, and machine learning. So that's good, right? We see things like this. Why are Palantir AIP boot camps so successful? Participants are starting to solve business problems in the first hour developing their AI intuition and making AI their own tool. They're seeing how AIP is raising the ceiling and lowering the floor. And AIP, I mean, there's, there's no debating like the level of interest in AIP overall, right? Based upon what we've heard from CARP, everybody and their grandma basically wants uh, to, to see what Palantir has going on AIP wise, right? And so there's two ways of looking at this. One is AIP could be a huge revenue generator directly for Palantir over the coming years, right? 2024 and beyond. The other way of looking at this is it's just a great branding way for Palantir to get more customers in Foundry, which is their big dog product, right? And so either way you look at this, um, it's going to be a huge benefit for Palantir in 2024 and beyond. It may not necessarily help Palantir's numbers short term, but I don't really think most people are in Palantir stock for the short term anyways. Most people are in it because of what's coming in 2024, 2025, 2026, 2027. The business model of this company is going to, you know, become over time. They're not in this company for the next quarter or this quarter or even the past quarter for that matter, right? So when you think about it from that context, I mean, AIP is going to be huge for this company. And this is something that's going to bode very well for Palantir. And, and, you know, they asked Snowflake's executives on the last conference call, when do we start to see a lot of this software-related revenue start to hit when it regards to AI? And he said, you know, the executive said 2024. So that's going to, I, I mean, there's a very high probability based upon these big government contracts Palantir has coming in and based upon how much interest they have from AIP, and how many deals they could potentially land on Foundry in 2024, there's very high probability that analysts are too low in regards to their estimates for the company in 2024, right? Now, me personally, I don't think I have enough shares of Palantir. Uh, that's my biggest fear, is I haven't bought enough Palantir shares. When I think about the best of breed product they have, when I think about how big of a cash flow beast this company's going to breed into over the next several years, when I think about them being in the perfect position from the government side and the commercial side, and the AI side, and data side, I'm like, oh my gosh, and the balance sheet, on top of that, the interest income, I, and I put all these pieces together, and then Carp having more credibility than he's ever had, I'm just like, dang, man, 
I think I need to load more shares of Palantir. I don't think I have enough, right? And, you know, Palantir is a cult stock. Now, some people look at that as a negative, right? And they say, that's bad, shouldn't be a cult stock. No, no such thing should be a cult stock. I want to be in a cult stock. Tesla's a cult stock, okay? And damn, I've done pretty well in Tesla over time. I love that Palantir's a cult stock. Why do I love that it's cult stock? Because that means I'm actually investing with other people that are actually there for the long term, not just a bunch of traders that are playing in and out of the stock. I love to own a company where we're all fighting over more and more ownership. We're like, I want more ownership of that company. I want more ownership. I want more shares. I want more ownership. I'm going to gabble up more shares. I'm going to own more shares than you. And we're all battling it out to see who can own the most shares. I love that, man. That's the type of stock as a long-term investor I want to be in. I loved it. That, that's, that's the best, man. I don't want to be in some stock with some weak shareholder base that people are like, oh, I don't know, man. I might hold it for a quarter and then I'll trade out of it. No, nah, I don't want that. I'm a long-term investor. I want to be around other long-term investors that are focused on where this company's going over the next two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, ten 10 years. I want people that understand the product on a high level, love the product. I don't know if I have met a more intelligent investor base than I have in Palantir. I, I, other than maybe Tesla, and I think, honestly, Palantir is actually a, a more intelligent investor base than Tesla. Back when I was first getting in Tesla, Tesla was an extremely intelligent shareholder base. Unfortunately, over the, as Tesla had a lot of success in the stock price, we did attract a lot of people that don't really know much in regards to Tesla, and, and they're just kind of in it because you know they're hoping the stock price goes up and those sorts of things. But um, in regards to Palantir right now, it's I think it's the most intelligent investor base in the stock market in terms of how much people understand what's actually going on out there in the world, in the product, in the financials, and everything across the board. I think it's number one. And so um, in, in regards to that respect, right? And so I'm very, very proud shareholder of the stock and I would love to grab more shares. And so that's another reason I'm going to this not scared. Send the stock down short term. I know their numbers are going to be bangers in 2024 and in 2025 and beyond. So send the stock down short term. This is just a gift for me to put some more shares in my my basket because I don't think I was aggressive enough in regards to Palantir because once again, 2022, right? It was was more of a risk adverse year for me because I got slaughtered. And then on top of that, their their profitability wasn't there. Now they flipped it. Profitability is there, right? The margins are there. The revenue is pouring in and everybody's in their grandma's coming to them. The government side, the commercial side, everybody's coming to Palantir. I'm 0% scared, folks. Okay. If you want to see my reactions live to these earnings and make sure you follow me on Twitch, that will be pinned comment down there. We will be uh, reacting uh, to the PayPal conference call tomorrow after the bell and uh, yeah, all that good stuff, folks. So it's always fun on Twitch. We cover the last hour of trading plus the earnings that are coming out. So appreciate y'all joining me as always. Much love. Thanks for being here and have a great day.